Man, well, uh, the title of my uh, sermon this evening is King Herod's Birthday Party. King Herod's Birthday Party. If you pick up in Mark chapter 6, verse uh, 14, let's start there. The Bible says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So here, what we pick up in our text here in uh, Mark chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ said we have gotten, we did get the whole context. The Lord has done miracles. He has driven out uh, devils. He did other miracles. And what happens is there is this buzz around town. They're trying to figure out who Jesus really is. And uh, this is not the first time that this is mentioned here uh, in other areas, in other Gospels. There is this questioning around town. Well, who is Jesus? You know, most people actually Jesus himself chimed in on it himself. And he said, whom do men say that I am? And they would say, some say you're Elias. And then another said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. And someone else said uh, that they say you're Jeremiah. In other words, Jeremiah. So everyone is trying to figure out who is Jesus. And in this same uh, situation here, <clears throat> it's the same thing. They're trying to figure out who is Jesus. And John, uh, excuse me, uh, Herod chimed in and he says, well, Jesus is John the Baptist. And not only that, he thinks that this is John the Baptist resurrected. If you all looked at the last uh, portion of verse 16, it says, but when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So Herod thinks that Jesus Christ is John the Baptist risen from the dead. Now, what happens is when he mentions John the Baptist, what happens is the Holy Ghost is recording the conversation of what men are saying about the Lord Jesus. And since Herod here quotes and says that Jesus is John the Baptist risen from the dead. Since he mentions that John, he says, it is John whom I beheaded. The Holy Ghost in verse 17 actually inserts the story of how John the Baptist was beheaded because Herod here just stated that I beheaded John the Baptist. So the Lord goes in, the Holy Ghost goes in further and gives us further detail about how and why John the Baptist was beheaded. Let's look at verse 17. The Bible says, For Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. So the beheading of John the Baptist actually starts with his preaching. Someone has a problem with his preaching. If you ask, well, what was his preaching? Well, notice for one, he was in prison because of his preaching. And his preaching is in verse 17. It said that Philip, uh, uh, who is married to this woman, uh, Her uh, Herodias, basically he's married to her. But his brother, who is Herod, actually took her to be his wife. So uh, what happens is John says in verse 18, this is the preaching of John. John said, for it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. So if you look at this and what I love about this is that, you know, most people you hear people talk about dispensations. Oh, this was for, you know, this uh, group here. This isn't for here. This is for this time period. But I think it's interesting because Herod is not an Israelite. Yet John the Baptist told him, hey, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Right. So the question is, well, according to what law? Right. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. John thought it was necessary to, uh, for him to abide by these laws here. Even though he was not an Israelite, he was not of Israel, yet he told him, hey, it's not lawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. If you're in Leviticus chapter 18, we're gonna go to Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20. Chapter 18 basically deals with what we know today is incest. 
where basically there is a, uh, a relationship, physical relationships going on between close family members. And that's what majority of chapter 18 of Leviticus deal with. And in chapter 20, it pretty much repeats these same sins over, but put the death penalty on them in chapter 20. So in chapter 18, let's look at uh, verse uh, 15. Let's start there. The Bible says, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. So notice what he says. This relates to Herod. Now you're wondering why John the Baptist say, hey, it's not lawful for you to have her. Well, why? According to what law? Well, this law right here. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. You look closely there. He says of. That word of is talking about that it belongs to someone or it's from someone. So he's saying is that this nakedness belongs to thy brother. OK, so he says thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy Thy brother's wife it is thy brother's nakedness so turn to uh, Leviticus chapter 20 and if you go to verse 21 remember chapter 20 is pretty much these same sins that were uh, mentioned in chapter 18 and in chapter 18 the Lord was explaining that these were the reasons why he was driving these nations out of the land where they had dwelt at at that time. Verse uh, 20 says, And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Okay, so what happens is the Lord puts a death penalty on the fact that a man take his brother's wife. OK, so that's a big issue when it comes to King Herod, because he has taken his brother's wife. OK, so the thing is, the Bible mentions as well that this is not to be done in someone's lifetime. OK, and meaning that this is not to be done when the person is alive. For an example, if a man has a wife. His brother should not take his brother's wife while they are alive, if that makes sense. It ought to be when his brother passes away that he can then take his brother's wife. That is not the case in this situation with Herod. Herod has his brother's wife while his brother is still alive. That's why it's a sin. That's why John the Baptist is preaching against it. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter seven says, know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then while so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she is called she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another to another man. So what happens is let's go back to uh, Mark chapter six. We see why John the Baptist is preaching against Herod. And he's preaching against Herod because Herod has his brother's wife and his brother is still alive. And his brother, he's basically sold his wife. He, he, he took in his wife and he made her his own. OK, so the Bible says, therefore, in verse 19, therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him. But she could not. So if you go, this same story is recorded in Matthew chapter 14. And in Matthew chapter 14, the Bible mentions how, how Herod wanted John the Baptist killed. Then here it says Herodias wanted him killed. She had a quarrel against him. So someone would say, well, that's a contradiction because Matthew said that it's Herod who wants him dead. 
Mark says is Herod, excuse me, uh, Herod who wants him dead in Matthew. Here in chapter 19 is Herodias who wants him dead. Well, which one is it? Well, actually it's both. Both of them want him dead. Why? Because John the Baptist is preaching against their sin. John the Baptist, you know, I can imagine him. John the Baptist is in our relationship. He's in our marriage. Why don't he just mind his business? Why don't he just shut up and mind his business? John the Baptist is preaching against us. Yeah, they both want him dead. So there's no contradiction there. They both want John the Baptist dead. So look at uh, verse 20. It said, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and then holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, and this is where our uh, message come in the title. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt and I will give it thee. As I mentioned, this story is recorded in Matthew chapter 14 as well. And in Matthew 14, it say King Herod's birthday was kept. In other words, that word kept is, is speaking about the fact that it was observed. OK, that it was celebrated. OK, so that's what it's talking about. So here it says that Herod on his birthday made a supper. So that's what we get our title from. He has this birthday and basically he gets this big gathering. And notice it's not just him, but the Bible says his captains, his chief estates and his lords. He have a whole group of people there to celebrate with him on his birthday. And, you know, the reason I, I, I really dove into this, because, you know, this was really just a wicked birthday celebration, you know, and the reason why is that we're going to get into it. At the end of this, you, we will see that no one should have been partakers of Herod on his birthday. This was absolutely wicked. No one should have showed up. They got invites. And I understand, you know, he's a king. And during these days, you, you, you know, basically dismiss the king's invite. This could probably cost you your life or something like that. But this is one where people should have said, no way, I'm not showing up. So you see, like, well, the, what's the main thing about Herod's birthday party? What's, what's the big deal around it? Well, first of all, King Herod's birthday party is a party of adultery. It's a party of adultery. Remember verse 17, for Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Well, the thing is, Herod is in open adultery. And basically, you can tell that it's open, it's out in the air. It's reported commonly that he has his brother's wife because even John the Baptist knows it. And he preaches against him saying, hey, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Everybody knows this. So here's the thing. Do you not think the people who showed up to the party, do you not think that they don't know he got someone else's wife? Right. So the thing is, he's just in flat out adultery. He's unashamed. It's just in the open. Everybody knows it. And it doesn't bother him at all. And the thing is, he invites many people to it. And. The reason I want to touch on the adultery first, that is something that we see at this party here, that he's just open adultery because the Bible speaks a lot about adultery. And, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, people may not take it as serious. You know, they try to change the words to water adultery down. Uh, no, don't use the word adultery. You know, let's use a affair or something like that. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about Adultery. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter six. And while you guys go there, I'm going to just quote a few scriptures uh, for one. Very easy. Thou should not commit adultery. Right. Uh, I'll quote Romans seven as we just went through. But the latter in verse two says for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. I mean, right there, the Lord just uh, flat out puts a death penalty on adultery, taking someone else's wife 
The Lord puts a death penalty on that. And although the world may take this lightly, you know what? One day this is going to be instituted again. Although America may just say, well, it's not a big deal. You know what? This is going to be instituted during that millennial reign of Christ where the adulterer will be put to death. Uh, also in Hebrews chapter 13, verse four, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. I like what he said. Marriage is honorable in all. You know what? It's an honor to be married. It's, it's a great thing to be married. It's held in honor. But the rest of the verse says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Hey, it's not an honorable thing to be a whore. It's not an honorable thing to be a fornicator or a whoremonger or something like that. There is nothing honorable about that. But marriage is honorable in all, as the Bible say. Uh, Proverbs chapter six, uh, if you guys are there. Proverbs chapter six, verse 26. It's one of my favorite scriptures when it pertains to. Adultery, it says, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulterers will hunt for the precious life. I think that right there is just flat out telling us that there are people who are just bent on people who just have it out to just commit adultery with people. People who want to just tear what's they, they I think they call them home wreckers today. Right. People who just want to wreck homes, people who just have it out to to hunt for that precious life and commit adultery with them. There are people out there like that. And it's uh, not just the, the, the woman, as it say, by the means of a whorish woman. But you know what? You got whorish men right. who want to just take women and commit adultery with them. It goes both ways here. Yeah. Uh, the Bible says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Hey, you know what? You commit adultery, you're not going to be held innocent. Something's going to come down on you. It's not going to end up good for you. I like what he said. Can a man take fire in his bosom? Can, can you just walk up? And, hey, I'm going to take this fire and watch me put it in here. I won't get scorched. No, it's not going to happen that way. He said, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? He's going to start shaking like, hey, you know, my clothes is on fire. Can, can one go upon hot coals? Can he... You know, tiptoe on high. No, it's not going to happen. His feet is going to get scorched. It's going to get burnt. In the same way how he cannot prevent those burns, the same way for that adultery. Hey, you're not going to be held innocent. You know, something is going to come down on you. Trouble is going to come upon you. Verse 30 says, men do not despise a thief if he's still to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be, bound, if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Notice what he said. Men do not despise a thief if he's still to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. Now, it's wrong to steal. Absolutely. But it's, it's one of those things where people can understand. OK, I understand you. You're poor. You don't have anything. You don't have any money. You stole to satisfy your hunger. I understand that it's still wrong. But at the same time, verse 31 says that basically he's still going to have to pay. He's still going to have to restore just the principle. Then on top of that, sevenfold on top of that. So the thing is, even though, yeah, it was wrong, people may feel sorry for you. The bottom line is that you still not, you know, held to a point where, well, we just let it slide. No, trouble still comes on that man and he has to repay. Verse 32 in this and likewise manner here, he's basically saying, but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Well, what understanding is that that he lacketh? What what understanding is he missing here? The remainder of the verse says he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Hey, that person who's committing adultery, it may be fun. Hey, Herod may thought that it was fun. <laughs> hey, guys, I got my brother's wife. Can you see this? Herod don't know that he had destruction coming on his own soul. And that's the deception of it. You think you're getting away with the adultery. You think, well, I didn't get caught this time. You, and you know how people go, if they don't get caught the first time or the second time, they get more boldened. And like I said, Herod is just, you know, in the open with his adultery. Everybody know it. John the Baptist know it. It's out in the open. Hey, Herod is going to get his soul destroyed. Verse 33, a wound and dishonor shall he get. Who is he? That adulterer. That adulterer is. It said, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. You know what? Here, here it is. What did he say? His reproach shall not be wiped away. 
You know, for one, he says a wound and dishonor. Remember, we just read in Hebrews, marriage is honorable in all. Well, guess what? When you commit adultery, the thing is a wound and dishonor shall he get. That's what that man is going to get. That's what that woman is going to get. Then it says, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. You know, when everybody see you, everybody know that you committed adultery, they may smile and say, hey, man, how you doing? Everything going good? Everything got well for you? But on the inside, you know what they're saying? Man, I remember this guy fell because he committed adultery. Everybody is going to remember your dishonor. Uh, your reproach is not going to be wiped away. Nobody's just going to, we're going to forget all about it. No, when you see that person, hey, how you doing? Man, that guy committed adultery with that woman. Verse 34, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Notice what he said, for jealousy. And I like what this says here. Jealousy is the rage of a man because, you know, Brother Devin was talking about this earlier this uh, morning, how we take words and we take them out of context. You know, and most people use the word jealousy uh, in the place of envy. You know, when you don't have something and somebody's saying, oh, you just uh, you're just jealous of me or they jealous of them. What they're really saying is envy, because envy is when you don't have something and you're desiring it or you wish you could have it. Someone else has it. But jealousy. Hey, there is nothing wrong with your own time. In Numbers chapter five, the Bible speaks about a man who's jealous over his wife where he feels that, hey, she has been out, she hasn't been faithful. And he's saying, hey, go to the priest. The priest is going to get this bitter water. He's going to get her to drink it. And if her belly swells, her thighs start to rot out and everything, that means that she has basically, uh, she has not been faithful to her spouse. And it speaks about in Numbers chapter five that that man, the spirit of jealousy come upon him. So there's nothing wrong with being jealous. So it says, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Hey, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Amen. That's what the Lord said. But what about a man who's jealous over his wife? It's going to be kind of hard to tell that man, hey, vengeance is the Lord. You know, the Lord is going to take care of it. That man may say, I agree, but on the inside, hey, vengeance, he want vengeance. The Bible said jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Verse 35, he will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. You know, you commit adultery with someone else's wife. You know, Herod, you take your brother's wife and you know you're in the wrong. You try to go back. Hey, you know. Philip, I know I was wrong. You know, here's some gifts. No, right. no, you took my wife. I, there is nothing you can give me right. to appease my wrath. Notice verse 35. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content. No, you can't, you can't give me anything. Though thou givest many gifts. Hey, you know, I got a ticket to a basketball game. You want to go out to, no. Hey, you want to go eat lunch over here? No. You send him a Christmas gift, return it back. No, he, he doesn't want that. Though you try to bestow many gifts upon that man. No, I don't want to hear it. You committed adultery with my wife. No. So what applications can we make here about this adultery thing that we can realize with, you know, Harry? Well, for one, use the right words. Use the right words. The Bible used the word adultery. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Because what do uh, the world say today? Oh, you know, they fell into an affair, you know, or they had, a, a, they had an extravaganza. No, no, no extravaganza. It's called adultery. That's what it is. You know, and then what about, you know, adultery in the church? You know, does this not go on in churches today? And what, get ha what happens when adultery occurs in the church? Oh, all right. Don't do that again. They sweep it up under the rug along with many other sins and everything. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But that is something that should be dealt with in the church. That adulterer ought to be cast out of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortionists or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, that is in reference to a saved person. 
If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. And early in his verse, he's talking about casting that wicked man out of the church. And what happens is he basically lists all these sins here that are basically um, eligible for uh, basically getting put out of a church. And you look at that, you say, well, I didn't see adultery. I, I didn't see that. I seen fornicator. I seen idol idolatry. I seen rape. I seen extortioner. I seen covetous. I didn't see an adulterer in there. Well, here's the thing. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You can mark it down. Look at it if you want. The Bible says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. And right after that, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Amen. So the thing is, God put adultery in the same reference as coveting. Because you want something that is not yours. So although he doesn't spell it out and say adultery, if you go back to Exodus 20, he says that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife as well. So when you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 5 here, where he says, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, there's your, that's your adulterer right there. That's your adulterer is right there. They're coveting someone. They want something that they can't have. And that covetous is really broad. It doesn't just stop there. That can be, you know, someone just, just always coveting. Oh, I want this boat. I want. And the, getting things like that, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you talk about, if you live a life, a conversation of covetousness, that's a problem there. Okay, so it doesn't just stop with adultery. And then thirdly, what other applications can we look at? Well, your favorite Hollywood star, right? You say, well, how does that work? Well, because, you know, in Hollywood, there is adultery that goes on as well. And I'm talking about adultery right on camera, where you can have someone in real life who they're married. They're married in real life. But when the director says, and action, right. they're in the bed you know, they're intimate with someone in the bed and everything like that. Hey, you think God gives two cares about the fact that you're acting? Right. He doesn't care. And cut. All right. Great, great scene, guys. Uh, we we want to get a little bit more into it. Let's let's do it again. Hey, that person is married in real life. God considers that adultery. You think God cares about when you say cut? And you can go to God at the end of the night. Well, Lord, we were just acting. That lets me know that you really don't take marriage serious in the first place. Yeah, you were acting. You're playing around. You're playing games with God. So your Hollywood actor who's up there and they're doing intimate scenes on the screen. You know what? They're still committing adultery. So you say, well, how, how can I be established on this? I don't want to commit adultery. I'm married. One day I'm going to be married. How, what can I do? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, the Bible says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Here's the bottom line. Get your own wife. There used to be a, a Snickers commercial way back. I guess it was like in the 90s or so. They used to say, you know, get your own or something like that. People wanted to snicker, get your own. Hey, it's the same thing. Get your own wife. And not only get your own wife, be content with her as well. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. What else can you do to avoid adultery? Have eyes only for your spouse. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 16, the Bible says, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shall thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. The Lord, uh, if you read Ezekiel, that the Lord is, is using a lot of, you know, um, using Ezekiel to get uh, his point across in various examples. He's using analogies. And sadly, this was going to be an analogy that God used to get to Israel as well. And what happens is he says, son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with the stroke. And then he says, when I take away, when I take away the desire of thine eyes, he said, this should be your response. Yet neither shall thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. So he's basically saying, when I take away that desire of your eyes, don't cry. Basically, just that like nothing happened. Well, you ask, what's the desire of his eyes? Verse 18, two verses later, this is Ezekiel speaking. He says, so I spake unto the people in the morning and at even my wife died. 
and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Well, Ezekiel just said, my wife died. That person who the Lord says, the desire of thine eyes, that I'm going to get them with a stroke. Basically, the Lord was going to allow her to die. That person was his wife. And notice the Lord says the desire of thine eyes. The desire of Ezekiel's eyes was his wife. Amen. Let's go back to Mark chapter 6. Herod here is just in open adultery. And we see that this, this party is already, this supper he has is already off to a bad start. Not only do we just see the adultery here, but then we see that this is a party where wicked vows are made. <coughs> wicked vows. Look at uh, verse 22. The Bible says, and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Herod here just made a vow, and it's a wicked vow at that. He doesn't know what's coming his way. Herod here, he basically not only has a party where, you know, he have his, his, his uh, lords there, he not only have food there, he, he had a, a great supper, but then he wants some entertainment there as well. The Bible said the daughter of said Herodias, she danced for him and not only for him, but the rest of the people that was there at the party. And he see her dance and he basically just loses his mind. He basically comes and say, I'll give you whatever you want, even up to the half of my kingdom. He, he basically is just hasty with his mouth. He's saying, hey, just name it. You talk about naming and claiming it. Just name it and you're going to have it. And, and that was the thing about Herod. He was hasty with his vow. A very famous guy. Let's go to uh, Judges chapter 11. There's a lot of people who make vows in the word of God. And what happens is, I think one of the, the I would say, one of the vows that you can't ignore is Jephthah. Because Jephthah, if you guys can remember him, Jephthah is born of a harlot. His brothers, they all are, uh, they have the same mother and father, but he's born of a harlot. If you look at uh, Judges chapter 11, look at verse 1. Sorry, I need to get there myself. It said, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And and Gilead begat Jephthah, and Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up. And they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So he's born of a harlot, but his brothers, they have the same mother or father. So they don't consider him part of the family. So they thrust him out of the family. They don't want part of him at all. And what happens is the Ammonites come up and they're about to war with Israel. So now they come back to Jephthah like, hey, Jephthah, um, I know we cast you out, but we want you back. And what happens is Jephthah, he didn't have to make this vow. Because it was God's will already to destroy the Ammonites. You, you go back to Genesis. God's listing all the nations who he's going to drive out. And the reason they're still around is because if you can recall, uh, in the days of Joshua, they left a great deal of those people in the land still. They didn't drive them out. They didn't uh, put them to death like they were supposed to. So what happens is he don't have to make a vow where God's promise, where God's will is already. You don't have to make a vow for that where, where God already wanted to destroy them. But look at verse 29 in chapter 11. The Bible says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house, to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. 
So notice one thing you have to be careful because someone can easily say, well, verse 29 said the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And then verse 30, he's making a vow. Well, you have to be careful. The spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost did not make Jeff to make this vow. The Holy Spirit gave him that boldness to cross over and go forward to the fight. He didn't have to make this vow. That's why verse 30 said, and Jeff devoured a vow. OK, so that vow that he makes is whatsoever. And he's just really hasty with his mouth. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter five. He's hasty with his mouth. He's not thinking that, hey, well, anything can come out of my house when I get home. That's his vow. Whatsoever shall come out of my house. Hey, I'm going to offer it up for a burnt offering. And he's not even thinking that, hey, well, what if it's my, you know, one of my family members? What if it's my daughter? So he's not thinking about any of that. He's just hasty with his mouth. It sounds like Herod whatsoever. You know, you ask for, I'll give it to you. Deuteronomy 23, you don't have to turn there. Verse 21, the, uh, starting at 21, it says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And you're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The Bible says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? So. God is simply saying here about being is basically speaking here about being hasty, being rash with thy mouth. And if you just look at some applications, you know, we've seen Herod here where he's just he see a dance and he whatever you want. OK, well, you know what? The thing is, we can be hasty in our life as well with some of our decision making. And we have to be careful about the vows that we make. I mean, let's let's get the low hanging fruit marriage. Right. Where people, you know, they get married quick. They meet someone, they get married quick. And hey, if that's, uh, you know, the case, then praise God for that. You get married. But then not too long after like a month later, this is usually what you see in Hollywood. Well, they just couldn't get along. He didn't like her cooking. She didn't like that he left his socks, you know, on the, f on the front doorstep or something like that. You know, it's all type of things. And guess what they do when they get out of the marriage? They want a divorce. And the thing is, is that people stand before God and they make these vows until death do its part. And then guess what? They don't fulfill them. Well, what do a lot of people say? Well, I just wasn't ready. Well, that sounds like what he said here. Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. And people don't know when you make vows like that. Hey, it's not just a vow to that person, but you're making a vow to God that I'm going to love and hold and cherish to death do us part. And the thing is, that is something that people have to be mindful of when they're making vows. Not only just that, I mean, marriage. What about, you know, uh, personal type of loans, bank loans and student loans and house loans and all type of loans that you could get? People sit down with people and they go to the bank, they they get approved for stuff. They shake hands and say, I'm going to pay it. All right. You want this annual percentage rate? I'm going to pay it. And then after a little while, they, you know, dodging them, people changing their phone numbers, you know, giving them wrong numbers and stuff like that. You know, and, and people look to get out of something that they have vowed to pay and they're no longer looking to pay it anymore. Well, the Bible calls that person a wicked man. Psalm 37, verse 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. 
So that's something that we have to be careful about making vows, that if we make vows, make sure we fulfill them. Make sure we go through with it because God, we don't want to be considered a fool in God's eyes. You know, you don't want to be a saved, born again child of God. But yet God considers you a fool because you can't keep your word. Let's go back to uh, Matthew. I'm sorry. Uh, Mark chapter six. Herod here is hasty with his mouth. He's ready to throw everything away over a dance. He sees a dance. He, he say even up to half of my kingdom. He's re ready to give us some authority around there. It's like, hey, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> I'll give you anything. But not only is his party a party of adultery, not only is it a party of wicked vows, but it's a party of inclusion as well. It's a party of inclusion. Look at verse 24. The Bible says, and she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. So the thing is, the young lady who danced, she has an option. Whatever you want. She goes to her mother and says, basically, what shall I ask for? The young lady don't know what to ask for at all. And, you know, she go to her mother. She asks. And I look at this. Her mother could have took the Haman route. If you all remember Esther. Where. The king asked Haman, what should be done to the man whom the king desires to honor? You all remember that? And what did he say? Well, he should let him ride in his chariot. I'm paraphrasing. He said, let me get in his chariot. He said his robe. He said his crown. Haman basically wanted to be king for a day. That's basically what he's saying. He wanted to be king. And if you think about it, why didn't she take this route? Why didn't she just say, well, ask him, can you serve in his castle? Ask him, can you serve as one of his, you know, his queens or something like that? You know, she could ask, can you, you know, ride in the chariot, wear the crown, something like that. But what did she say? She's at, she told the daughter, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And if you're the daughter, you really have a right to ask a question. What does John the Baptist have to do with me? Mom, what should I ask for? I can ask anything up to half the kingdom. Ask for John the Baptist's head. What? What does that have to do with me? She had the right to ask her that question. What does John the Baptist have to do with me? But remember, it's a party of inclusion. You say, how is that? Well, the thing is, Herodias, the mother, she is the adulterer. She's the adulteress, excuse me. She's the one caught up in adultery. But what happens is, she looked to include someone in on her adultery. She looked to bring someone else in to assist her on her adultery. And she does that by asking her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. And what we see is that the parent is including the child in on her sins. Just think about that. The child has nothing to do with her mother's adultery. That's between you and Herod. And you have a problem with Harry. You want him killed. And what does she say? Get John the Baptist's head. The daughter has the right to say, for what reasons? What has John the Baptist done to me? There's another example of this. Go back to Judges chapter 17, where we see a parent who actually includes their child in on their sin. Judges chapter 17, we have Micah. And in verse 1, it says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim who, whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, First of all, this is a very dysfunctional family. You say, how is that? Micah, as a grown man, steals from his mother 
and she pronounces a curse on the fact that she has she has not the money. I'm assuming here she's probably angry because she lost 1,100 shekels of silver. She pronounces a curse, and he comes and say, "Mother, I I took the silver." And she said, "Blessed be thou, my son." Well, in Micah's household, you can steal from your mother and get blessed. I mean, what kid wouldn't want to grow up in that household, right? You can steal and you won't get in trouble, right? This is a very dysfunctional family. We'll see even further. And when he had restored this 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. If you stop there, you say, wow, man, she's, she's a holy woman. She really worships the Lord. She said, Micah, that money that you took was going to be for the Lord. I was going to dedicate that to the Lord. Uh, not so. Look at the rest of it. To make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Her way of worshiping the Lord was to take the money and go build an image, a graven image. That's not that's not holy. Yet he restored the money unto his mother and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. So what's going on now is just back and forth. Here, you take it. No, you take it. No, mom, you take it, son. You take it. They're going back and forth saying, oh, you take it, you take it. And what happens is the mother finally take it and say, OK, I'm going to go to the founder. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create an image. And notice what happens at the end of that verse. It said, and they were in the house of Micah. This these verses never said that Micah was into idolatry. It never said that Micah sought out to create images, but it was in his mother's heart to do this. His mother had a thing for idols. His mother wanted to create images and she figured that she's being holy by dedicating it to the Lord. But she abs uh, she actually gives it to her son. These are her sins. This is her abominations. And she said, son, I'm going to dedicate them to you. And actually it became a thorn in Micah because look at verse five. She just gave him a house. She just, it, it just said in verse four, and they were in the house of Micah, but he took it another level. And the man Micah had in house of gods. These guys are also known as devils. So think about this, Micah had a house full of devils. And how did it start? His mother who had this thing to follow after idols. She loved graven images. She wanted the founder to create images. And then she said, here you go, son. Come on in. Get this. And he take it another step further and just got a whole house full of idols, full of devils. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an image, excuse me, made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. You say, well, what's the application here? Well, here's the application. How many people have sins? They have abominations. They have things that God just consider wicked in their own life. And they look for other people to come in and join them in on their sins. They're committing adultery. They're filled with abominations. And they say, hmm, who can I help me with this? I mean, just think about it. Hey, if my wife called, say I was with you. Don't we hear those type of things? Girl, if you know, he called, say we was over your house where you bring it in other people to try to cover for you and your sins. We see the same thing with Herodias and her daughter. This sin has nothing to do with Herodias. How many people actually lose their life in other people's sins? Other people's sins. You know, uh, some years ago that uh, post uh, club shooting, you know, a lot of people was like, oh, you know, not everybody in there was a sodomite. Not everybody in there was gay. Well, how did you even get in there then? Right. What are you doing in there then? Yeah, yeah. And that's not it's something you get into. But what happened? The people who were sodomites said, hey, come on over here and party with us. Come on over here and drink with us. And you know what? You got destroyed right with them. Yeah. People who include other people in on their abominations and they look for them to justify their sins. Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that. Oh, you know, just come in. And you, hey, if you want to be wicked, if you want to be filthy, you be that all by yourself. Don't ask me to come help you out. Don't be asking me to cover for you so you can continue your filthiness. I don't want any part of that. Yeah, right. 
So it's the same thing with Herodias getting her daughter. Hey, come on, ask for John the Baptist's head. Hey, what does John the Baptist have to do with me? We have to be careful of that. Don't let people drag us in their weakness. If they're going to be sinful, hey, let God deal with them. They're going to have the wrath of God on them. Stay away from it. Let's go back to Mark chapter 6. Not only do we see that this was a party of adultery, it was a party of uh, just wicked vows that were made. It was a party of inclusion, people including others in on their sins, their abominations, their filthiness. But lastly, we see that this was a party where men, where man desired to please men rather than God. It was a party where people sought the praise of man rather than the praise of God. Look at verse 25, 26. It said, and she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his old sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. Did you all see that right there? Notice it said, Herod was sorry, but then it said, yet for his old sake, because of the vow that he made, and for their sakes, which sat with him, for those, you know, those captains, those chief men, it said he would not reject her. So here it is. Herod had an opportunity to do right. Remember in verse 20, it said Herod, it said Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. You know, this was a time where Herod, who as the king, could have backed out and said, OK, no, time out, time out. I know I said whatsoever, but no, this is off limits. John the Baptist, as he just said in verse 20, is a holy man. John the Baptist is a righteous man. John the Baptist is a man sent from God. John the Baptist is preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist is baptizing in Jordan. No, off limits. I'm sorry. Ask for something else. But what did he say? It said he felt sorry, but then for the people's sake who was around him, he, he sought their approval. But not only that, look at verse 17. Look who else. For who else say he did this for? He was a people pleaser. Verse 17. For Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison. Why? For Herodias sake. There it is again. He wants to please man. More than God. This was in Herod's heart. What was in Herod's heart? The heart to please man instead of God. Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, I, I've heard, you know, um, you know, people uh, say in Acts chapter 12 that this is a different Herod. I'm not, uh, I'm not mad at that, you know, uh, anything. Um, I can't see why that would be said because there were different Herods. Remember, uh, at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a Herod who sought to kill the child Jesus. And then when they, Joseph and Mary went into Egypt, the Lord sent the word back to Joseph saying, those who have sought your life, they are dead. So after that, Herod, Herod was dead. Now we have another one here during the days of John the Baptist and, John, uh, and Jesus. So there's another Herod that rose up. So in chapter 12, I, I wouldn't doubt it if uh, there's a, this is a different Herod. Uh, that's pretty much, much not what I'm going to jump into, but it's the fact that this Herod carries the same characteristic as the Herod in John the Baptist day. You say, well, what's the same characteristics? Well, look at verse one through three in Acts chapter 12. The Bible says, now about that time, Herod, the king stretched forth his hands. Excuse me. Now about that time, Herod, the king stretched forth his hands to vet certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Well, you all notice here. He basically puts James to death, who was the brother of John. And he see that it pleases who? Who did he want to please? The Jews, the Christ rejecting Jews. Since he basically killed James, and he basically get, I can imagine a crowd behind him. Yeah. He basically like, hey, 
They kind of like this. Where Peter, you come to, let's throw him in prison. So he wants to please the Jews. He wants to please man. So whether it's the same Herod or not, they have the same characteristics that both of them want to please man rather than God. So the thing is, this doesn't surprise me that unsaved people have a heart to please man rather than God. You know, you may have those who desire to be saved, you know, and they're, they're searching for salvation, and everything. They want to be saved. I can understand that. But you can't expect a saved person. Excuse me. You cannot expect an unsaved person to have a heart for the things of God it is. You can't really expect that. But the thing that gets me is saved people, so-called Christians who want to please man rather than God. That burns me up because the thing is, this is what what took place in Jesus day. You know, there was a lot of people who believed on Jesus, but they were secretly believing in him. You don't have to turn there. But John chapter 12, verse 43 says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Look at that. He said many people believed on him. But here it is. They were secretly believing. They didn't want to openly confess him. Why? Because they worried about pleasing man. They didn't want to be cast out of the synagogue. And look what he said after that. For they loved the praise of men more than the praises of God. And that's where their heart was. I want the pat on the back. I, I want to be seen in the marketplace. I want to be called rabbi, rabbi. You know, that's what was in their heart. They want the pat on the back from man. And a lot of saved people. This is the problem. A lot of churches today, they have the love of man in them. That's what they have. They want to please man more than they please God. You know, you get a lot of people, you know, don't say nothing about the sodomites. Don't 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 say nothing about fornication or or just stay away from there. Why? Because, you know, you're going to get persecuted. You know what? Well, they, they look into please man because the Bible says, yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And, you know, the world today looks at if a church is going through persecution, they actually doing wrong. And it's funny that the Bible is the exact opposite. If your church is going through persecution, then you're doing the right thing. And what do a lot of Christians say? Oh, you guys are not loving because you're going through a lot over there. No, I think that shows the love that we have over here because all that would living, uh, uh, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Galatians 1.10, you don't have to turn that. He says, for do I now persuade men or God? That's a very good question to the saved person, to the so-called Christian. Who are you trying to persuade? For do I now persuade men or God? You say, well, what does that mean? Well, the very next portion of the verse, or do I seek to please men? He's talking about whose approval are you trying to get? Are you trying to get man's approval or are you trying to get God's approval? Whose honor are you trying to get? He says, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You got these people. I got a way of serving Christ and still getting along with the world. No, that's impossible. If you're going to be a friend of the world, you're going to be an enemy of Christ. It's not going to work that way. You have to choose, as Moses said, who's on the Lord's side. You have to choose the side because you cannot serve Christ and say, well, I got a way, a, a new way where we just bridge the gap. No, there's going to be a gap. There's a sword that comes down and you need to decide, Christian, what side of that sword you're going to be on. He says, if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. It's impossible to please men and be a servant of Christ. It is, it's not going to work. In John chapter five, I like what Jesus said here. He's speaking to the Jews who are these unbelieving Jews. And what happens is, is that although he's talking to them, it's some very good principles in here about being men pleasers versus being a pleaser of God. The Bible says, he says, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I like this part. He says, I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my father's name and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? 
That's where their honor was. They wasn't trying to honor God. Their honor is, hey, I need to do this so he can see me and he'll honor me. That's where their heart was. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So, hey, you know what? The honor should be coming from where we should seek our honor, where we should seek our praise is from God himself and not be as Herod, who is a people pleaser, both in Mark chapter six and in Acts chapter 12, where he's just trying to uh, to uh, have man's approval. He's putting godly people to death because of man. Herod here <clears throat> wanted to please man. And I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. But the thing is, this is my personal opinion when I say this. But I think this was the day. This was the celebration. I think this was the birthday celebration, the birthday party that actually sealed King Herod's fate. I really believe that. That's my opinion. I think this was the day that sealed his fate as done. You say, why is that? Well, notice the Bible said early in chapter six that he heard John gladly. John did great things before Herod. Herod heard the preaching against him. He heard the preaching of John all the time. He heard him gladly. And you know what? Herod had a voice in his life. That voice was John the Baptist. He had a voice who was telling him, hey, don't do this. Don't do that. It's not lawful for you to do this. And you know what he did with that voice? Beheaded it. And I think this is the birthday party the day that sealed his fate. You say, well, I, I doubt that. Well, the reason I believe that, you can turn it if you want, but Luke chapter 23, when Jesus is arrested, Herod questions Jesus. And in verse eight, the Bible says, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long time because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Wait a minute. Think about what he just said. Herod desired to see Jesus, not to get saved, not to hear the preaching. But what do you say to see some miracle? Herod likes to be entertained. He liked to. He, hey, he had a dance. He had a supper with a lot of people around. He likes to be entertained and he get Jesus when Jesus is arrested. He says, basically, this I, in my mind, I'm imagining this because he said that he hoped to have seen some miracle. I can imagine Harry. Hey, Jesus. Hey, that thing where you walked on water. Can you do that? You know, that that, that feeding the five thousand. Then you fed four thousand as well. Can you do that? Hey, that you know, that that thing where you drove the demons out. Can you do that? Hey, the thing is, it said he desired. Excuse me. He hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So that's why he's questioning Jesus. He want a miracle done. But I like verse nine. This is why I say I believe Herod this day with beheading the John the Baptist. He sealed his fate. Verse nine said, then he questioned him in many words. This is Herod questioning Jesus. Hey, what about this, Jesus? What about this? Well, what about what about this? What about that? Verse nine said, then he questioned him with questioned him in many words. But he answered him nothing. Can you imagine that? Hey, Jesus, what about this? How do, how do I get saved, Jesus? But what about this? Is, is, is eternal life? I, I heard that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What, what do I have to do? Right. It said that he questioned him with, here's the key words, many words. Jesus answered him, not a word. It's nothing. You say, well, why? Because John the Baptist preached to you many times. Yeah, right. The Bible said that John was sent from God. Hey, you know what? He was there to bear witness of the light. He was there to preach Christ. Herod had his chance. And you know what he did? He beheaded that. Yeah. He got rid of it. And now you see Jesus not even talking to him. Why not? Because you had your chance. Finito, you finish. Right. Don't need to say anything. And if you continue to read that, you think Herod got any better? You think Herod desired to get saved? No, actually, Herod began to mock him, get his men to mock him. They're the ones who put the crown of thorns, uh, thorns on his head. They're the one who put a robe in him and bowing down to him. Herod didn't get any better. That party, I believe, was that party where it was done for him. You say, well, what can we take away from this? Romans 15, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
you know what? Herod's birthday celebration was for our learning. Well, what? That we ought to avoid adultery. That we ought to be careful with our words, not making hasty vows. Also making sure that we don't get drug in on other people's sins, especially just as sin is sin, but especially these exceeding wicked sins where people are trying to get you to cover for them. No, I'm not trying to be a part of that. We have to be uh, careful about that. And then uh, just lastly, being people pleasers, we ought to be careful not to be like Herod, where we're out to please man rather than God. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word, Lord. We thank you for uh, this story here. Uh, I don't think it's here by coincidence or chance anything. I believe that uh, these here are for our learning and for our admonition. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will bless us as we leave this uh, place this uh, evening. Give us safe travels as well in Jesus' name. Amen.